I'd like to welcome you all and particularly I would like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Tunji Funsho, who is not only the chair of the Nigerian Polio Plus Committee, but also a member of the Rotary International Polio Plus Committee. And also Dr. Pascal Makanda, who is a, a member of the World Health Organization, and he is the Polio Eradication Program Coordinator for the whole of the WHO African region. And I'm sure it hasn't passed you by that on the 25th of August, we had great celebrations because of the certification of the African region being wild polio free. And part of the reason for this evening's event is to make sure that we don't all think that the job is over. There is much still to do to secure the future. And our speakers will be get telling us where we're at, why we're there, and where we've got to go. So without any further ado, um, you can ask questions, but only via the chat system. And could I please ask that when you post a question, you only send it to Keith Paver. So that's to Keith Paver only. And Keith will sift through your questions uh, for later in the session. Please don't send him 25 questions. We do need to be fair so that anybody who wishes to ask a question at least has a go at one of those questions. So any questions via chat to Keith Paver, please. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to welcome our first speaker, who is Dr. Tunji. Funsho. So Tunji, may I ask you to tell us about your work in Nigeria? Once again, thank you all very much for having me and thank uh, to Janine for all the hard work in putting all of this together. Uh, and thank you all for finding time to be part uh, of this event. I, I think uh, it's a very momentous time uh, for us at Rotary International and also uh, with the GPI partners of uh, WHO, UNICEF, uh, the CDC, and the Gates Foundation. In recent times, uh, the uh, Gavi uh, Vaccine Alliance. Uh, the first image is just to remind us, you know, as to uh, precisely what all of this effort is all about, which is getting those pressure drops of the oral polio vaccines to all children uh in polio endemic countries below the age of five to ensure that they are protected against the wild polio virus we are at a momentous period because we have reduced the number of who regions by one the afro region is now no more a polio endemic country as the next slide will show this is entirely uh, due to the efforts of uh, Rotary International and our GPI partners. Uh, without them, this work would have not happened. But we must also give ourselves a pat on the back because without our initiating the effort and convincing our GPI partners that is something that is worth doing and something that can be done, will not be at this point where Africa have been certified polio free. Next slide is, is about where we are today, that WHO has certified um, Africa a polio-free region. Why is this important? It's important because uh, number one, we were not expected to be the last, the, you know, the second to the last region to exit uh, because of our previous uh, challenges and difficulties that I'll mention in a minute. But also it's important from the point of view of the primary purpose we start this, to ensure that no child is ever paralyzed again by the wild polio virus in the Afro region of Africa. Uh, and we got here by uh, dint of a lot of hard work. But next slide, we have to give credit to a very uh, Im important initiative that took place in 1996. 
the initiative itself was catalyzed by uh, Rotary International leadership, uh, initially by President Herb Brown, uh, who was our president in 1995-96, uh, and then uh, subsequently in the following Rotary year, 96-97, a formal uh, campaign was kick-started by then our president uh, Louis Guy of blessed memory now, and also the foundation trustee at the time, Rajendra Sabu, who along with uh, President Nelson Mandela of South Africa, uh, launched the Kick Polio Out of Africa campaign. Now that campaign uh, really kick-started the efforts in Africa uh, to ensure that we start reducing the number of children that are afflicted by the wild polio virus. At that point in time, Africa was having about 70,000 wild polio cases annually. And no country in Africa has started mass immunization campaigns. These kick polio out of Africa effort that was catalyzed by Rotary and was initiated uh, and propagated uh, with the strength of his moral conviction, Nelson Mandela, uh, brought African countries, 30 African countries within that year, had mass campaigns, which started in the cascade of events that led gradually to many African countries exiting the nations that were still transmitting the wild polio virus. As the next slide will show, we would um, appreciate how well we have come from when we started this campaign in 1985 to where we are today. From 125 countries with 350,000 cases of polio every year in 1985 to a point today where we only have transmission in two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as the last count, we had barely uh, 110 cases of the wild polio virus in the world. Next slide uh, just shows how gradually Nigeria got to this point. You see a much more detailed um, record of uh, what the cases were around the world um, over the last 15, 20 years when Dr. Pascal gives us his presentation. Uh, but you can see initially we thought we were polio free um, in 2016, we, we were still just counting another year when the insurgency in the northern part of the country, not eastern part of the country, uh, showed us that we're not there yet because uh, children who hitherto were not treated by the uh, oral polio vaccine, uh, when their geographical areas and territories were elaborated, were discovered, you know, were to have polio. We had four cases of polio. Um, from zero cases in 2014 to four cases, all happening about the same time in Borno State in August uh, uh, 2016. So we're back to the drawing board, but again, thanks to Rotary and our GPI partners, we're able to mount a very robust outbreak response. Um, uh, it is quite gratifying that despite the risks, uh, we had the team of the IPPC chair, Mike McGovern, and, and uh, uh, Polio Plus director, uh, Carol, who, who traveled all the way you know, from, from the US and joined us uh, in, in the actual uh, capital of Bornu State that was the epicenter of all the crises, uh, both insecurity and also uh, the, res the resurgence of the wild polio virus. Next slide. Um, shows how we finally got uh, WHO, the African Regional Certification Commission, to accept all our documentations um, and all their visual verifications in every nook and cranny of Nigeria that the possibility of any wild polio virus existing in any part of Nigeria is next to nil. And as a result of that, uh, we were removed from the list of fully endemic countries. Uh, which next slide was what eventually uh, we'll see that only two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan, 
are the only countries now uh, transmitting uh, the wild polio virus. Pakistan much more uh, than Afghanistan, but um, the transmission is occurring you know, around the borders between the two countries. There are political uh, reasons for, for this, and there are also social reasons for that. We don't have enough time to delve into that uh, during the course of this uh, discussion. Now, on the next slide, we will see that to get to where we are today, we, we've worked in four major thematic areas. One is advocacy. Advocacy to Rotarians, because as you all know, the, the, uh, the turnover of Rotarians is high in the Rotary world. Um, there are new Rotarians joining us all the time who do not you know, have any, any knowledge of how we started this program and how involved we are and why it's our priority. So we advocate to Rotarians. We also have political advocacy to the highest echelons of government, traditional leadership, and also religious, religious leadership. Uh, part of the challenges we've had in this country is uh, certain groups, particularly religious groups, uh, had some concerns about this, the safety uh, of the vaccine. And so advocacy is something that was very, very uh, crucial to getting acceptance of the vaccine. Creating awareness, because sometimes um, we think we know what is good for people, but we need to convince them it is good for them. Uh, and so what we've spent a lot of our energy and efforts and resources doing is creating awareness through all kinds of medium that are appropriate to every environment, just to ensure that people are aware that this is something that we're doing, this is something worth doing, and this is something that uh, is protective you know, for their children to prevent them from being paralyzed by the wild polio virus. And indeed, through that, we're able to mobilize the communities themselves uh, to also advocate uh, for families to ensure that they make sure that the children are made available uh, for immunization. Fundraising is crucial. Uh, the figures will be mentioned later on in my presentation um, uh, because without funds, uh, if you, you recall, we started this campaign in 1985 uh, to raise 120 million US dollars to eradicate polio by the year 2000. We raised almost twice that amount of 240 million US dollars. But as of today, we spent almost 19 billion US dollars. Right, fine to note that um, uh, Rotary International played a huge role in raising most of those funds uh, through other sources, but Rotary itself, uh, with the Gates March, has raised 2.1 billion US dollars as I speak. Um, it's a glad thing also that uh, 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 United Kingdom has been second, second only to the United States the largest you know, the donor and the largest mobilizer of funds uh, for our efforts, uh, having made available 1.2 billion US dollars uh, and uh, made a further pledge a couple of months ago of another 400 million US dollars uh, through 2023. So we're quite grateful you know, for your advo advocacy efforts. And I think one should also give credit you know, to um, Polio Advocacy Task Force Chair Judy Dement, who has uh, worked at the top echelons of the British government, and also the Commonwealth uh, and the European Union to ensure that these funds keep coming. Field activity, of course, gets us to where we finally needed to be, to be able to uh, put those precious oral polio vaccine drops in the mouths of these children, so we protect them against uh, the wild polio virus. Next slide is, is um, just showing some uh, pictorial uh, of the events that uh, we've done under this advocacy. This is what, when uh, President Barry Raisin was here uh, some two years ago. Uh, this is about funding. Most of our funds, uh, including the Gate Max funds uh, of annual 150 million US dollars, go through WHO and UNICEF for both operational uh, purposes and also, you know, for the purpose of ensuring that the right kind of personnel and the coaching equipments are made available. Next slide is part of our media advocacy through television, radio, 
uh, social media and the like. Next. And of course, these parts of our creating awareness, we do road walks, you know, regularly, uh, at least twice a year. The, the, the largest usually is during World Polio Day. And this is right across the country, uh, in every state and in every district. Next slide. Uh, this is just showing, you know, uh, some field activities. That's past RI President John Majagbe on the left, immunizing during one of our immunization campaigns and Rotarians uh, assisting in immunization. And you can see uh, the quite popular uh, pinky finger uh, being done by a volunteer. Next slide. So what challenges have we faced? I mean, we, we have gotten uh, this far with, with a lot of challenges, but I'm glad that we're here because it means we've been able to surmount those challenges. I've mentioned briefly about, you know, active anti-vaccine groups, we also have issues of low immunization coverage because our primary health care you know, uh, structure is not that robust. We've had insurgency in the Northeast, as I mentioned. Uh, funding continues to remain a problem because the goalposts keep shifting uh, and that makes it more expensive. And of course, in recent times, we had COVID-19. COVID-19 um, has come to uh, disrupt but also to enable in some areas. Next slide. So what innovations have we you know, put in place uh, over the course of the last decade at least to, to surmount some of these challenges? One is to, to work outside our normal uh, campaigns to have what we call permanent health teams. These are teams of vaccinators who are always at the ready to move to areas where there are challenges of low immunization or where there are challenges of um, insecurity. Uh, and that takes me to the, next, the third bullet point, which is the third, third bullet point, which is hit and run. What that means in essence is that uh, the military would go and clear an area of insurgents, cordon it off to make sure that the vac vaccinators are safe. The vaccinators you know, go there purely for a couple of days immunize children and come out. And then we have reaching every settlement, uh, which is also enabled by the military. The military uh, will reach settlements and ensure that uh, they are safe. Im immunizers will come in and immunize children or the military themselves, if they feel it's not safe for vaccinators to go, actually do uh, the immunizations themselves. Then we have health camps. Some of the reasons why some groups, you know, do not accept the vaccines is that, as I mentioned, primary healthcare structure uh, uh, are not very active. Uh, basic healthcare is not available and people start to wonder why we come to bother them, in quotes, every, every month or every other month with a polio vaccine. Uh, so we have health camps which provides uh, primary healthcare. And during that process, mothers will bring their kids and any child below the age of five will take the opportunity and immunize them. Then there have been quite a few technological innovations. Uh, one of them is the AVADA, the audiovisual um, acute flagless paralysis detection and reporting, which essentially help us even in areas where that are insecure, that are remote, for health workers to be able to report cases of acute flagless paralysis. For them, for us to now move on to investigate uh, to see whether these are actually polio cases or other other cases of acute flaxis paralysis. As you know, um, paralysis can be due to a lot of other causes, including some viruses, but of course, uh, injuries as well. We have the uh, geographical information systems that we use. Uh, part of it is, is to enable uh, us to uh, do mapping uh, during campaigns so that we know which areas uh, vaccinators need to go and we'll be able to know when they go there or not because they have apps in their cell phones which tell us that you know they've been to a particular area and then we have the open data kit which everyone carries here most rotarians who go to the field also carry it it helps us to to locate um, areas where people have gone to immunize uh, gives an idea of what the family size is in those areas. 
And uh, it, this is collated centrally, you know, so that at the end of a campaign, we can say that there have been so many people in the field, uh, so many children immunized in this particular location. And if there are any gaps, uh, that will be easily identified. Uh, that's the OBK system. So these are some of the, you know, innovations that we have uh, uh, brought into play to ensure that uh, we get to where we are today. Next slide. Funding I've spoken about uh, very briefly, um, but uh, let's go to the next slide. I think um, we, we, we need uh, for the next year, uh, we need 929 million US dollars, you know, for all aspects of the program. The anticipated available resources, uh, as you can see, is 800 million. But as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, an effort that the goalposts keep shifting, particularly uh, with the advent of vaccine-derived you know, polio cases, uh, the gap may be as high as 470 million US dollars. Next slide. Uh, Rotarians in particular now generally ask, particularly in those areas like Great Britain, um, that polio cases have not been seen for, for decades. Why do we still need funds? Um, Africa is polio free. Shouldn't we be spending less? Uh, the fact is, is that the budget will, will still keep increasing because our efforts now, for instance, in Nigeria, surveillance is a very, very vital aspect of the work we need to do. So our surveillance structure has to be kept strong. Uh, and that is one area, as you can see, you know, that, um, 23% of our funding goes to. Then of course, campaigns. Now we are going to be faced with campaigns for vaccine derived, as well as the regular campaigns that happens in virtually every African country, uh, the national immunization days. And let us not forget, Pakistan and Afghanistan need to do much more campaigns in order for them to get rid of the circulating wild polio virus. So, uh, when people ask, you know, when, why do we still need to contribute funds for this program? Uh, this is the reason why. Even when a country is polio free, you still need to continue immunizing children. You still need to ensure that surveillance, you know, system works so that, you know, the wild polio virus doesn't sneak in through the, the back door and before you realize it, it has spread again. So Rotarians will be expected to raise um, 150 million years over the next three years because our agreement with uh, the Gates Foundation uh, up to 2023 now uh, is for us to raise 50 million US dollars every year and the Gates match will be 100 million US dollars. So in the next three years, Rotary expects to spend a minimum of 450 million US dollars on polio eradication. And we hope that all clubs, you know, will play their part in ensuring that we need these targets. I'm glad to inform you that we reached our target for the last Rotary year for us a little bit more. Uh, it was an uphill task. Uh, there was a lot of recruitment to ensure that we got there. So fellow Rotarians, you know, uh, have you committed, you know, to donate to the polio fund, no matter how, how little, uh, and get also, you know, our friends and associates to do the same. Every little drop, like the polio drops counts to get us you know, to uh, realize our budget. Uh, participating in, in immunization activities does not necessarily have to be in the United Kingdom, which uh, has eradicated polio for a long time. But I know uh, some of you have traveled to India in the past uh, to participate in immunization. Pakistan is still available uh, and Rotarians still go to Pakistan to assist immunization. But very important, I think, the role that you can play apart from fundraising is uh, creating awareness, continuous creating awareness amongst Rotarians, among the public, uh, through the print, electronic, and social media of the need to eradicate polio. And the fact that we're almost there, uh, victory is almost virtually assured that we get there. Now, COVID-19, the spoiler, it depends on the way you look at it. Of course, it has led to cessation of mass campaigns, particularly for vaccine derived. 
uh, it has reduced the, uh, uh, the number of routine immunizations carried out because of safety. And also, uh, some of the funds that otherwise would have been spent on polio eradication has gone to diversion of funds uh, to the COVID pandemic. But then it has enabled us uh, to repurpose our resources to kickstart uh, uh, the response. Uh, also, to test run for our polio legacy, a lot of our polio um, resources already are being used for things like malnutrition and also other um, you know, vaccine preventable diseases in children, uh, like measles, for instance. We, our staff do take part in measles campaigns. And uh, it's given us an opportunity to learn new lessons and how to surmount them. Uh, next slide. Just some of the things we did during this uh, COVID-19 era, billboards, flyers, next slide, uh, which went wild and also giving our palliatives, you know, to families who couldn't earn a living because of the lockdown. Face masks, we, we made, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. So post-COVID, resumption of, you know, supplementary immunization activities will start uh, in November. Um, we're going to focus on strengthening routine immunization now, particularly that we have uh, surmounted uh, regular immunizations uh, for house to house. And then our advocacy efforts, as soon as permitted, we're going to start visiting our state governors to ensure that they keep their eyes on the ball. So while we keep polio at zero in Africa, we want to ensure that we keep our eyes uh, on the necessary things to keep ourselves away from COVID-19 uh, so that at the end of the day, we'll be able to continue tackling uh, our efforts to end polio now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tunji. Um, there's a lot of information there. The slides will be available via email afterwards, but hopefully you can see how important it is that we keep up the effort and, and amazing what we have achieved, but much, much more still to be done. So I'd like to now introduce Pascal. Um, if I can just make sure that I've got your microphone working, if you just bear with me a moment. Yes, it is. And I'm going to share my screen again with Pascal Makanda, who is, as I said before, the WHO Polio Eradication Programme Coordinator for the African region. So over to you, Pascal, please. So thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Janine, uh, for the introduction as well as uh, for inviting me to speak to the distinguished uh, Lotarians of uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, I'd like to mention that it's quite an honor uh, for me this evening. I was telling Janine that uh, when as a young man, I started medicine at University, of, University of College London. And when I finished, I went back to my home country, uh, Malawi, uh, where I worked on the polio, first polio campaigns. Uh, in the African uh, region. So to speak to the uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, Euratorians, it's quite an honor this evening uh, for me. I would just like to say that uh, much of the details have already been uh, provided uh, in, in Dr. Tunji's uh, presentation. For me, it's just to provide the uh, overview uh, of the African region and as well as to fill in some technical gaps uh, which uh, people may have uh, to maybe explain, need more explanation at the end. So one way to look at this um, uh, struggle with uh, polio eradication, white polio virus eradication in the African region is to look at the trends and the critical events uh, from a very long time. Next. So here I've just uh, put some critical events uh, which, which took place. Uh, as you can see that uh, the World, World Health Assembly uh, declared in 1980 that smallpox had been eradicated. I think one thing we need to learn from this is that the declaration to eradicate smallpox uh, was made in 1959. So it took 21 years 
uh, for smallpox uh, to be eradicated. Uh, but for the white polyvirus, as you can see uh, from, from 1988, when this declaration was made, and I should emphasize here that Rotary played a very important role in having the World Assembly to declare that indeed white polio can be eradicated uh, globally by the year 2000. In the African region, we did not make uh, much progress. Uh, so eight years down the line, and remaining only four years before 2000, um, the Rotarians again reached out to uh, President Nelson Mandela of South Africa in 1996, after the heads of state of the Organization of African Unity uh, declared that indeed we have to eradicate uh, polio uh, from Africa. So this shows again the important role which the Rotarians made to put more energy, mobilize more resources uh, for us now to start doing the campaigns, as Dr. Tunji mentioned. We had made some progress, as you can see from the, the bar charts, uh, but in 2003 and 2005, uh, we had vaccine refusals, uh, mostly in Nigeria, where the campaigns were stopped. And this started again another upset uh, of cases. I would uh, like to mention that I was, I don't know what you call it, like or not, that I was among the people who were sent by the regional office uh, to go to Nigeria to work with the Rotarians on the ground, awareness, <coughs> advocacy, related to things could start again. As we're making progress, the issues of security and accessibility as well came in. And it is uh, very important here, just as uh, Dr. Tunji mentioned, that again, the Rotarians went to speak to the uh, state governors, uh, speak to the people on the ground, and we worked very hard together with the GTI partners to ensure that we were able to access the children in these areas. And as you see at the tail of the graph, that indeed we started seeing few cases and really by the end, we were certified that we're free of white polio virus. Next, Janine. So I would just like to mention that this issue of certifying the African region to be free of white polyviruses was not just an African affair. There is an independent body of 16 health experts in uh, virology, uh, public health, uh, pediatricians, and whatever, who were appointed in 1998 to independently oversee the issue of certification of WHO in the, uh, the WHO African region. What was required was for them to see that indeed, after three years of not seeing any case, the visit countries uh, see the quality of surveillance, how sensitive it is, uh, before they can declare that indeed the region is free of white polyviruses. We have members uh, from all the six WHO regions, uh, from the African region, the Americas, East Mediterranean, Europe, Southeast Asia, and West Pacific, bringing in a lot of independence and expertise from the other regions for them to be credible that indeed, when we say that we have stopped this one forever as we have. In fact, two of these uh, members are also the members of the Global Certification Commission, which will be the body, independent body, which will declare that indeed uh, polio is indeed eradicated uh, globally. Next. <clears throat> so it has been a long journey uh, really for us to go to certification of polyviruses. Um, this bar chart uh, just shows us that from 2004, when we had three countries, the first three countries, uh, to be accepted that indeed they have stopped transmission of a virus, we made some good progress, uh, reaching 24 countries within a period of uh, four years. But in 2008, we had a lot of setbacks with uh, importations and polio coming back into the countries. So really, the, the commission suspended the issues of accepting a polio free status of these countries. So we stagnated uh, for close to um, six years when our country again was uh, told that they, they are free of white polio virus. Um, after all this work uh, in 2015, again, when we had really made out of progress, we can see that we moved a bit faster. And we have 47 countries, which are in the African region of WHO, and that was achieved just this year in June. Um, uh, 2020. Next. 
So I'd just like to share with you the certificate uh, which the members of the Aquarian Certification uh, Commission for Foreign Education concluded on 25, 25 August 2020, the transmission of wild poliovirus, indigenous wild poliovirus, had been interrupted in all 47 countries of the African region. And these are 16 members who signed this um, certificate. We really like to thank again the lottery for everything which you did uh, for us to really celebrate this very important milestone towards global uh, certification of polio eradication. Next. So on that very important uh, occasion on 20, 25 of uh, August, knowing how important uh, we see and value uh, Rotary. We had uh, Mr. Uh, Hogak Nak, the president of Rotary International, and uh, Dr. Tunji Efunshu, who just uh, spoken uh, to us, among some very important dignitaries, Mr. Bill Gates himself, and all the leaderships uh, of the Global Poor Education Initiative uh, there, uh, participating in this important milestone uh, towards global uh, certification. So, this was a recognition of how much Rotary has supported uh, the GPI. The next. So what has taken us to achieve a white polio free status in the African region and what has been invented? We have spent approximately 4.4 um, sorry, sorry, million billion um, uh, dollars, uh, almost 9 billion doses of oral polio vaccine, tens of millions of uh, volunteers, and an unwavering commitment of Rotarians and other corporate or education initiative partners and governments. What we have benefited out of this uh, drive is that we have averted 1.8 million children would have been paralyzed from white poor virus who have not been paralyzed and enjoying a very healthy life. As we also know, in addition to paralysis, polio as well kills. And we have averted again another 185,000 children would have, been, would have died uh, uh, from polio. And the economic uh, um, uh, estimations is that close to, we have benefited close to 20 billion um, uh, US dollars um, in this drive of really having people being able to contribute to the economy of the countries and as well as participating in other social uh, events. Next. But what we have achieved uh, in terms of um, uh, as uh, white polio virus uh, interruption, is that we still have uh, issues uh, in terms of polio still existing. This uh, map just shows uh, the areas uh, in green where we're having what we call the circulating vaccine that have poliviruses. I'll come to that. And these are mostly in Africa, uh, but also we're seeing them uh, in um, Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'm mostly focusing on the ones for my region here, the African region, which is the type two. But we've seen as well that we have secreting vaccine developed poliviruses in other regions of South African region. So the same emerald in Afghanistan and Pakistan, we're seeing them in Yemen, we're seeing them, uh, the type one in the uh, Philippines um, and, and other countries beyond the African region. So there's a threat here of us having one polivirus introduced uh, back into the uh, African region. We have seen that before uh, in 2004, 2006, 2009, when uh, white poliviruses from India, that time when they have big outbreaks there, uh, came to Angola and you had several countries affected after Angola. So there's still a threat as long as we have areas which are still having circulation of white poliviruses. Now, coming to the circulating vaccine, there are uh, poliviruses. These occur when, as we all know, when you're giving these all polio vaccine uh, drops, they contain what you call the attenuated uh, strain or weakened strain of the polio virus. And when the children excrete this uh, virus, because this is an oral um, uh, 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 vaccine, it gets excited to the environment and it can continue circulating in under immunized uh, uh, populations, particularly where it's poor sanitation. And if it continues to circulate, then genetically it mutates to a form that can cause paralysis uh, in the children. These uh, CVDPVs are rare occurrence, not as virulent as fast spreading as white well polyviruses. We have vaccines um, that are able to stop the spread of these CVDPVs. And uh, from the data which you have from the African uh, region, I don't want to go into much details about that, we see that when you use 
two, uh, two doses uh, of um, a monovalent vaccine, we're able to stop close to 77% of these uh, outbreaks. The African region was making progress towards stopping this disease, uh, but we had to postpone, just as um, Dr. Tunji mentioned, uh, because of this COVID pandemic. And therefore, we had to repurpose the polio funded personnel to become the frontline workers uh, to work on the COVID uh, response uh, in the African region. We have a new global strategy to stop the CVDPVs between 2020 and 2021. Um, next. And the first one is that we have to resume these aggressive outbreak responses, these vaccination campaigns, uh, despite COVID. We have done quite a good work despite the COVID pandemic in the African region, uh, in Angola, as well as in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Ghana, in terms of responding despite that we have this uh, uh, pandemic and reaching very good uh, quality. So we know that can be done even with uh, this COVID, but ensuring that we have the right, the right global measures of stopping spread of COVID. We are going to, starting from uh, November, use a new uh, novel uh, vaccine. Uh, called NOPV, um, which we've seen that is quite good, it's quite stable, and can, we should, we're very confident that this will assist us uh, later to stop these uh, outbreaks. Dr. Tunji already talked about strengthening routine immunization, which is important, and because we have to be very aggressive, ensuring that we have sufficient stockpiles of the vaccines, and that's why that number which Dr. Tunji was talking about, of 450 million, which is required, much of that as well will go into stockpiling vaccines so that we can be very aggressive in our response to stop these SVDPs. So, as I said, my job was here just to thank uh, Rotarians. And I would like to mention that they, we still need the Rotarians, just like uh, Dr. Tunji uh, mentioned. I think the job which the Rotarians have made uh, to be so trusted, sticking to uh, the goal of uh, eradication all these years since uh, 1988 is unparalleled by all other uh, partners. We were the spearheading uh, partners who decided that we have to do that and have stuck to that, which has brought us to trust that indeed we can see this through with the unwavering support and ensure that we still maintain a, a polio free, a white polio free um, uh, Africa as well as stop these SVD PVs. So we still need uh, your help. Your help uh, in advocating, as was mentioned, your help in mobilizing. Uh, communities, your help in supervising uh, as we've been coming to the African region to assist us to show that we have very good quality uh, campaigns which have been very successful. So we know that still continue with you that we're not going just to uh, stop here, but we will work together uh, to ensure that we don't have any polio anywhere uh, globally so that we, this disease becomes a disease of the past. I would like to mention that we have a website uh, which Rotarians are encouraged uh, to visit, as you can see uh, there. Uh, this website really shows a lot of work which Rotarians have done uh, in the countries, and as well as the other partners, because we really value all the support you have given to us to be certified free of polio virus and to continue to maintain a polio-free Africa and polio-free globally. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Pascal. It really is about a joint effort and it's a, a joint effort at every level. And I just want to personally thank particularly both Tonji and Pascal, because you can imagine getting to the point where there's the certification event on the 25th of August. It's been a very, very busy few, few weeks. And obviously with COVID and polio and everything else, They've actually found the time several times to spend an hour or so with me planning what they were going to be addressing this evening, as well as giving us their time and their effort this evening. So thank you both from the bottom of our hearts, because we need to hear it from you guys, because we can sit here in Great Britain and Ireland, where most many of our attendees are from this evening, and we can think that we've done enough, you know, we don't need to do any more, Africa's polio free, and there's only two countries left, but actually there is so much more still to be done to make sure we don't lose the, the gains that we have made and that we actually finish the job that we've started. And, and to help you, you know, we have got a polio team here. Myself, I'm, I'm Janine Bertwistle and I'm part of that team. 
Keith Paver, who's going to be asking some of the questions in a moment. Keith is part of that team for Region 20, which is the upper part of Great Britain and Ireland. Derek Rothwell can't be with us. He's the Region 21, the southern part for the End Polio Now coordinator. Judith Diamond, who um, Tunji has mentioned, Judith is our National Polio Plus Advocacy Advisor, along with many, many other things for polio and other things, but Judith is part of our team, and Eve Conway, who is on the Countdown Campaign Committee. So we're all here to help you, um, but for this evening, let's focus on the questions for Tunji and for Pascal. So Keith, can I ask you to give us one of the questions, please? Yes, I'm, I'm being selective, but uh, this is a question that applies as much to other countries where polio has been eradicated for a long time. It's from Babai Mai Minor, who is in the Buono state of Nigeria. And he, he's asking about the fact that, that they are getting problems of non-compliance due to the fact that the locals, that is the caregivers, believe that since polio has been eradicated in Nigeria, why on earth do we need to go on giving the vaccine continually again? So um, basically it's compliance where people believe that the problem has gone away. Um, not only in terms of vaccination as it is in Nigeria, but in terms of fundraising in many other parts of the world. So I think Tunji might want to be the person to answer that question if he opens his mic. <laughs> That is, that is going to continue being the major problem we have to address, uh, you know, to convince people, you know, of the necessity to ensure that as long as there's polio in any part of the world, no child is safe. And I always quote to them that countries like Great Britain, the United States, that have not had polio for decades, still immunize their children against the wild polio virus. Um, Therefore, the only way to ensure that their children are safe uh, from imported wild polio virus is to make sure that by the time uh, any, if for any reason, you know, we're unfortunate that the wild polio virus is imported uh, from the two endemic countries, all children in Africa, uh, particularly in Nigeria that has just exited the League of Nations that has been transmitting the wild polio virus all children are covered. We're looking at a coverage rate of about 85 to 90 percent, such that even if the wild polio virus comes back, children are protected. So that is our major area of advocacy now. Can I suggest that uh, Baba Mai actually talks to Tunji outside of this meeting about the kinds of campaigns, you know, that, that, that you're carrying out to convince people that this is important. Um, Moving on, and uh, it's a question about people who are who are survivors of polio. It, it's one that it occurs here as well. Uh, it was a question from I'm trying to feel, find my way through them, but it was it was basically a question from Jill Russell. Is there any information on the help that is given to survivors of polio in Africa in general and in Nigeria in particular? Well, uh, part of our polio plus. Uh, in Nigeria in particular, is that, you know, we do uh, provide wheelchairs and uh, specially ad adapted wheelchairs that we call tricycles uh, that is self-propelled. Um, we provide thousands of them uh, to polio survivors in Nigeria, to children to, to assist them in going to school, and also to adults to uh, help them in attending to their vocation and earning a respectable living. We also have partnership with districts in India, headed by past RI President Raja Sabu, who come almost annually to Africa, Nigeria in particular, to do polio corrective surgery, so that uh, polio survivors who have been crawling can now walk after surgery and uh, some uh, aids. They may be calipers, you know, and other kind of uh, walking aids that they can now stand erect and walk and be less dependent on other people. Uh, so uh, we support polio survivors in that way. We have a very peculiar kind of uh, sport uh, that was developed by polio survivors in Nigeria called para soccer, uh, which is playing uh, literally handball uh, on, on skates. Um, 
which we support every year. And we actually fund uh, the national competition, uh, the final of which holds during World Polio Day week uh, in Nigeria. So we're quite involved with our polio survivors because they are huge partners in ensuring that we break non-compliance because they do assist us in going to areas where uh, families reject the polio vaccines uh, and they are great advocates. When families see them and they tell their stories, uh, families that hitherto reject tend to now accept because they don't want to see their children uh, becoming like that as a consequence of rejecting the polio vaccine. Thank you, Tunji. Um, Keith, if we could just ask one more question, please. Right, again, it's the, this is to Dr. Pascal. It, it's about, it, it's really an immunological question and he's really asking that he, this is from Cordo Said, who says that looking at the map of CD, CVDVP in Africa, it's very similar to the, the map you would have seen with meningitis in the past. And he wonders if there is a, an immunological reason for greater susceptibility or, or great or, or, or non-response to the vaccine, I suppose, in these regions than other parts of Africa, uh, which could apply also to a COVID vaccine as well. All right, so th thank you very much uh, for the question. It's, it's indeed correct. I mean, when you look at the meningitis about, it runs from the west part of, um, of Africa, from Senegal, going all the way to, uh, to, e to Ethiopia. Um, I won't put it uh, really like there is some magical uh, workplaces there could, maybe there could be, but uh, that has not been really uh, proven. Uh, but what we know is before we withdrew um, the, the type two component of the oral, of the oral polio uh, vaccine in 2016, the coverages based on routine immunization in this uh, belt again, was very, very low. I uh, would have shared that, I didn't want to go into much details, but indeed it showed us already, we did some monitoring already, and we knew that these are the areas which are going to be at very high risk because of the low population coverages which we had in these, in these areas. We did a very good work with the, uh, the Gates Foundation on this, and so we know what the coverage is very, 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 very poor. Even when you look within the countries, uh, if you look, for example, in Nigeria, um, uh, that even within the same country, most of these cases are in the northern part of Nigeria, so the whole Nigeria, because that's where we had very low coverages for quite a number um, of years. So to us, it's mostly because of the low population immunity. Uh, there could be some issues. It could be linked with the meningitis, but that we don't have any proof uh, as, as of now. I would also just like to uh, quickly add that when you look at these areas as well along the Sahel, these are areas where we have very, very weak systems. They're very challenging areas, very difficult uh, weather to really, for us to really be able to administer uh, any kind of vaccine, whether it's meningitis vaccine, or it is uh, or, 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 or poly vaccine or other, other vaccines. These are very, very difficult areas. And some of these areas well, that also suffered a lot from insecurity, as I've been hearing all the time, Mali, Burkina Faso, all those, uh, these areas. So there's a lot of other factors uh, beyond just the uh, immunological. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps I can talk to you, Pascal, about outside of this meeting. If you, if Judith, um, Janine will share your email with me. I have other things I'd like to talk about, but perhaps as a virologist. So over to you, Janine. Thanks very much, Keith. Um, I'm conscious that uh, the time has disappeared very quickly. So if any of you do have any further questions that we haven't been able to address, or any other subjects that you would like us to be covering in these polio webinars, you have got my email through the Eventbrite arrangements. Please reach out to me and we will make sure that we do cover them, whether it's part of our polio team in Great Britain or Ireland or reaching out to others. But you know, one of the advantages that's, uh, that I actually see from COVID is we are actually now realizing how small the world is. And being able to actually have meetings like this with Rotarians and others from all over the world is a really, really important thing because it is only by all of us pulling together, working together, sharing ideas, sharing, sharing experiences, celebrating successes and helping each other to overcome the challenges that we are going to be able to eradicate polio forever. Um, 
I would like to send you, if anybody has an objection to it, could you please let me know? But when I send you the information, I would also like to send you some information about a, an online activity, an online social media challenge that we're doing in Great Britain and Ireland, and we'd love people all over the world to take part, which we're going to be launching on the 24th of September. So it's going to be about um, end polio goal challenge and it's it's a very simple online challenge for you to take and to share on the basis of nominating three friends to take part so if you don't want to know about that please let me know when I contact you uh, before I contact you early next week with the details of the recording um, I'd also like to um, offer to both Tunji and Pascal 30 seconds each just as any last minute message or call to action that you want to give us and I'd also like you all to save the date our next polio webinar will be on the uh, Wednesday the 11th of November at 7 p.m London time and that will actually be with some Rotarians who are polio survivors talking from the heart about what this is campaign is all about and why we have to continue it. So that's the 11th of November. So Tunji, can I turn to you please? A last minute message. Yeah, thank you, Janine. Um, yes, we, we, we are 99.9% uh, .9 to achieving our goal. Uh, and I always want to close on the note of looking at the smaller picture. Uh, we talk about statistics, uh, so many cases of wild polio virus in Afghanistan and Pakistan on our weekly uh, updates. Uh, but I just want to remind us that, you know, each you know, of those numbers represents a child uh, whose life has been changed forever. And the lives of the family has been changed forever. Uh, those who are familiar with families with um, uh, children with disability will appreciate what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, both parents have to devote more time uh, to this one child. Yeah. Uh, and um, as a consequence of that, the other no, children no. will suffer some form of deprivation emotionally. And in Africa, a child who normally would have difficulties because of poverty is now even made much, much poorer because of disability. So when we are looking at polio eradication, let's look at that small picture of that one child who is paralyzed by white polio virus and the devastating effects on that child and their family. And that is why we need to continue this work until every child is safe from the wild polio virus. Thank you very much, Tunji. And I think if uh, everybody listened to that message, then we would have a lot more action, positive action by Rotarians and our communities. Pascal, a last minute message from you, please. So thank you very much. Uh, what my last uh, message is that uh, indeed what I've been able to achieve working with uh, Rotarians is a legacy for future generations. We have stopped as of now uh, children not to be paralyzed anymore by an indigenous white polio virus which came from the African region. This is not a small feat which have been able to achieve and this will be spoken for generations, years and years to come, that this support was a noble cause uh, for us to stop the suffering of the children. And therefore, while we're experiencing these secreting vaccine developed polio viruses, which are also paralyzing the children, I would like to leave, uh, dare ask Canberra that Rotary still continues to support uh, this work so that we stop all forms uh, of paralysis, whether it's a uh, uh, secreting vaccine derived poliviruses or the white poliviruses being imported uh, from Africa, that this should be stopped once and for all so that we continue the good legacy which Rotary has given uh, to the future generations of the African continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. And um, thank you to everybody that's taken the time out to, to join us this evening. And thank you for everything that you have all already done to help Rotary end polio now or in your own fields, because I know we have uh, workers here from other organizations involved with it. But please, please, please keep your foot on the accelerator, not on the brake. Share with us what you're actually doing, share your success stories, and keep making sure that your community 
know how important eradicating polio is. Let's get rid of one virus off the planet Earth so that we've got energy and time and commitment to look at other things. So thank you all very, very much. Don't forget the date of the um, 11th of November, Wednesday the 11th of November, and details will be available shortly. Um, and as Nan McCready said, let's think about Clem Renov, who uh, passed RI president, who has recently passed away, and how instrumental he was in the polio campaign. Let's honor his memory, and let's honor all the memories of people who have died from polio, who are suffering from polio, from post-polio syndrome, and indeed all the workers and volunteers who have lost their lives or have been injured in doing the work. Thank you all so very, very much and good evening.